Hi folks, welcome to Human Biology. In this set of three quick lecture videos, we're going to talk about what the big questions are in biology and we're also going to talk about the four major themes um, that you see in human biology. So those big questions are, how do the structures of the body enable life's functions? And that goes along with the theme of structure and function. Second is, how actually do you build a body? Um, that goes along with theme number two, hierarchical levels of organization. The third question is, how are living bodies regulated? How do they manage, essentially, how do you manage to stay alive? Um, and that goes along with theme three, homeostasis. The fourth question is, how do body systems alter one another's functioning? And that goes along with theme four, which is integration of systems. So we're gonna go through each of these questions in turn. So, number one, structure and function, um, which is, in a sense, um, when you flesh that idea out, it's the answer to the question of how the structures of our bodies enable us to stay alive. And the, the typical way, the shortcut way this is described is that structure equals function. What we mean by that is that the way that something's structured determines the kinds of job that it can do. So a couple terms to define, just so that we make sure we're all on the same page. When I say structure, I'm talking about how something is built, what its form is, what its makeup is, or how the parts of something are arranged. Right, those are, are synonyms. So as you're reading and listening throughout this course, when you see form, makeup, arrangement in your head, think structure. Next, function. So function is a way of describing the job that a structure, um, actually that anything uh, can do. Um, other ways of describing this, other synonyms are, what's the role of this structure? What task does this structure perform? What's the responsibility? I put that in quotes because it's, <laughs> it's not exactly like your liver um, has a choice about fulfilling its responsibilities. Um, and then last but certainly not least, when we say, we use the word determine, what we mean is um, that not just that two things are related to one another, but that one is directing the other. One is governing or causing something in the other. All right. So... In this slide, what we have are three different types of tools. Scissors over here, a hammer, and an adjustable wrench. And what I'd like you to do is just take a minute to think about um, the job that you would use, the kinds of functions that these tools have, what jobs they do and then think about what's the structure, what about the structure allows for the tool to be good at that particular kind of job. So take a second to think about that. Okay, hopefully you got some ideas percolating around in there. So let's start with the scissors, right? The job of scissors is to cut things. Um, 
usually to cut flat things, right? Not like you wouldn't use the scissors to cut a piece of wood, for example. So what is it about the structure of a scissors that makes it um, useful for cutting flat things? Well, you have two blades that, that have sharp inner surfaces. Um, and those two blades are held together by a rivet that allows for them to swing with respect or to slide across one another down at this pivot point. In addition, it's quite useful that you've got two different hand grips, right? If you wanted to really go into this, you could think about what's the difference between scissors for people that are right-handed versus left-handed. I'll just let you keep thinking. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the hammer, right? The job of a hammer is, um, to one job is to hit things, right? And if you're thinking, well, there are different kinds of hammers. Exactly right. And the different shapes of hammers are used to hit different kinds of things, right? Now, primarily use this type of hammer to hit nails. I believe this is what's called a framing Hammer, hammer. Anybody who's involved in construction may have called, but if I'm wrong about that. <laughs> um, so, what makes this good to hit things with, particularly nails? Well, a nail has a flat head, right? So, you here's <laughs> that's my fabulous drawing of a nail there. Um, so, this part of the hammer has a a nice flat hard surface right the surface um, that the head of the hammer is made out of needs to be hard as hard or harder than the material that the nail was made out of otherwise you, the hammer is just going to bend so that's something about its structure right it's also as I said it's got a flat head um, it has a handle Right? And it's got a nice grip on the handle so that you're less likely to slip and hit your thumb, especially if you're me. Um, and then we also have this area oops, at the bottom, um, which is used for pulling out nails that are, um, that are, um, holding two things together or that have been hammered into a board, for example. So you can slide this narrow end underneath the tiny um, part of the nail that still sticks out and it has this V shape so you can get the head of the nail in there and then ratchet the hammer this way. All right, so I don't think I need to go through the adjustable wrench for you. Hopefully you're getting the idea there. Um, the point is that for everything, certainly that I can think of, um, whether it's made by humans or um, made by other animals, right? Think about a bird's nest. What is it about the structure of a bird's nest that allows it to be a cozy home to raise baby birds in? Um, as well as structures that are visible on the surface of our body and in the interior of our body. The way a building is structured determines what it's good for, right? Um, as you can probably tell by the background noise, I am not in a sound studio. I'm sitting um, in my backyard recording this so you can hear the birds. Um, so it's not an ideal place to record lectures, I suppose, but well, at least <laughs> it's ideal for me. It might not be ideal to listen. Okay, so to, let's connect this to our course content. Anatomy is, is the noun that, that is used 
for the study of the structure of the body. Physiology describes the study of the function of body structures. The two always go together. So now what I'd like you to do is, again, take a second or two, think about some part of the body. This is not, this is not uh, meant to sort of gauge if you know anything about the body at this point, right? I assume people don't, don't have knowledge when they come in. But just think about any part of the body um, that you're familiar with and then sort of brainstorm with yourself. What is it about how that part of the body is structured that makes it good for the job that it does? Ready, set, go. Okay. So I'm going to, in my brain here um, the two things that come to mind for me um, are <laughs> did I mention I can't draw <laughs> um, our hands and um, which is you know you can see from the outside of your body and then the other thing in terms of interior structures um, that I thought of was the stomach, probably because it's getting close to lunchtime and I'm hungry. All right, so let's talk about the hand first. What is it about the hand that allows it? Uh, well, first of all, what are the functions of hands? What jobs can you do with hands? Well, you can pick things up. Um, you can hold on to things. Um, you can um, hold your child's cheek so that you can give them a kiss on the head. Um, and those things, all of those things are made possible by the structure of our hands. So we've got four fingers, and then we have what's called an opposable thumb, right? Our thumbs um, are what allow us to grasp, right? If you um, look at your hand right now and um, pick something up, right? Try to pick it up without your thumb. I think you'll find it's a lot more difficult. Um, you can curl your fingers once you pick something up and carry it, think like a grocery bag, for example. Um, now think about anybody, if you have a pet, um, you know, a, a cat or a dog, they don't have the same kind of thumbs we do. They do have a digit that they have five digits um, on their paws but they can't pick things up or hold things in the way we can because their thumbs work differently. All right, how about the stomach? So the stomach receives food that you put in your mouth and chew or liquids. It goes down through this tube called the esophagus and the stomach is, um, as you probably know, if, um, you're hungry, right? Your stomach um, starts to growl and you can kind of feel your stomach moving. Um, your stomach is preparing. Um, it's full of um, a really acidic liquid called gastric juice. And by the by, you don't need to remember these details about anatomy right now. This is just to make the point about structure and function. So you've got this acidic gastric juice. It's full of all kinds of things that are 
um, all kinds of things, all kinds of molecules, all kinds of chemicals that are good at breaking uh, material down into smaller pieces. The stomach is also really muscular. And <clears throat> finally, the stomach has, and this you can't see until you look at the interior. So if we're thinking of, okay, here's a cutaway of the stomach, and then I'll put my gastric stuff, my gastric juice on top. It has these ridges in it that are called rugae. And there are different places in the body, uh, different structures in the body that have these ridges called rugae, um, which is just Latin for ridges. And that's related to the function of the stomach as well. Because it's hard to believe, but the stomach is actually one of its major functions is to store food. So the part of its structure that allows for its job as a storage organ for food are those ridges. The part, the two things that really help with breaking food down, which is what digestion means, are the chemicals that you, specific chemicals you find in there, and the fact that you have a lot of um, muscle. And when those muscle, the muscles in your stomach contract, your stomach um, squishes the material inside. Squishes, technical term. Okay, so structure equals function. Oops, not function, function. The way something is built determines what it's good for. When structures are damaged, either by disease or trauma, it compromises their function. All right, question two. How are our bodies organized? Um, and the answer to that is in hierarchies. Um, a hierarchy, uh, hierarchical organization means that you have small pieces that are a limited number of small pieces that are organized into a larger structure. And life is, all life is organized in this way. So you'll notice, we'll go back, I'll go through this, but um, you'll notice at the bottom here, I have the word organism. The term organism means a single living thing. So you're an organism, um, the plant in the pot I'm looking at right now is an organism, um, a bacterium is an organism, a single living thing. All right, so let's go back to the smallest pieces. Subatomic particles, of which there are only three, make up the 92 different naturally occurring types of atoms, which are called elements. Atoms are combined into molecules, and the definition of a molecule is two or more atoms held together by energy. Molecules are organized into progressively larger molecules um, and, and then eventually um, into cells. 
Now the cell is a really important level in this hierarchy because it's the first level of organization where we observe life. So that, that means a couple of things. First, um, it means that every single cell in your body, with the exception of um, the dead cells that make up the surface of our skin, they are alive in and of themselves. Um, and we actually, scientists actually now know how to take some of those living cells out of the body and put them in a special dish <clears throat> and keep them warm, provide them with enough um, nutrients, enough moisture, and they will live for a certain period of time. Uh, cancer cells will live forever in a dish. That's one of the properties of cancer cells. But non-cancerous cells have a um, have a, a particular lifespan in the same way that an organism like a human <clears throat> um, or a dog has a particular lifespan. So cells are alive in and of them by themselves. Now. Cells can be organized into <clears throat> units that we refer to as tissues. A tissue, I'm running out of space to write here. A tissue is defined as cells of the same type. that are organized for a common purpose. It's a little abstract, but um, as we, thank you, buddy. Sorry, it's Mr. Spot, my dog. Um, cells of the same type are organized for a common purpose. Right, that's abstract, but um, in a couple weeks when we start talking about the different types of tissues that make up the human body um, and the differences between the different types of tissues, I think you'll see um, that that'll become a lot more concrete. Tissues can be organized into organs, right? So an organ is, oops, what's going on here with my pen? Two or more. Issues organized for a common purpose. And then an organ system is two or more organs. You guessed it. That are organized for a common purpose. Now, right, everything um, that's outlined in green here. Things that are, um, oops, outlined in green, sorry. All right, so how do you know you're looking at a biological hierarchy? Well, if you can show that the level that you're looking at, let's say the cellular level here, is made up of components or bits from the level below, you've got a hierarchy. So organisms are made of organ systems, right? So and in this example, and this is this, uh, I believe I used the same example in your book, um, the organism, one of the um, organ systems in human organisms and other animals is the urinary system. The urinary system is made of multiple organs, the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, the urethra. If we just take the bladder, right, and look at that, um, 
it's made of different kinds of tissues. You've got um, smooth muscle in the wall of the bladder. You have both smooth and skeletal muscle helping to control the flow of urine. The bladder is lined with yet another kind of tissue. Right? If we just look at smooth muscle, right, we're looking at the tissue level. And smooth muscle is made of smooth muscle cells. Smooth, and as we'll see, cells, uh, particularly the kind that um, we're composed of, are made of quite fancy, uh, they're quite fancy, so our cells. Um, but one of the major components in our cells is a non-living molecule called water. Water is which has the chemical formula H2O, is made of two hydrogen atoms, that's the two, the H stands for hydrogen, and a single oxygen that gives you one molecule of water. You can also see from this explanation point number two, which is to build complex structure, you start with simple parts. Right? And you're probably aware, for example, that there's smooth muscle in places other than your bladder. Right? I just mentioned there's smooth muscle in the wall, or there's muscle in the wall of the stomach. It's smooth muscle. Um, changing how smooth muscle is organized is going to change how it functions. And that leads to the third, which is you get a, a lot of, by building something this way with simple structures that can be combined in a lot of different ways, you get a lot of different structures at the end without having to have a whole lot of complexity in the base or at the, I'm not sure if we call that the base, but at the, in the smallest units. So the cell's the basic unit of life. As I said before, all living things are characterized by the flow of matter, which is stuff that you can measure, well, stuff that you can weigh, let's say it that way. Um, energy, which is what organizes and moves matter and information. So for life to exist at the cellular level or the organismal level, you need a flow of information inside cells, right? We're gonna talk about that. You need a flow of information between that, each single cell and the environment around it, and then between one cell and the next. That the second two of those flow of information between the cell and the environment and between cells requires that individual cells as well as organisms have to have the ability to detect and respond to their environment. Living things don't have an endless supply of matter and energy, right? And when we talk about um, metabolism, when we do biochemistry, we'll get more into that. Um, the point I wanna make here is that we take in energy in the form of our food, and we also take in matter, raw materials, in the same format, which is food, and our bodies transform that matter and energy to generate energy that's useful for doing work in the cell and in the body. Um, we also produce molecular waste in the form of carbon dioxide and water when we do that. And we produce what's referred to as waste heat because anytime you do a chemical reaction, you have a little chem, um, waste heat. All of the chemical reactions in your body 
are defined as metabolism. So what are the results of hierarchical organization? Well, in the, this is in a way, this, this first point, I'm sort of restating what I've already talked about. Changing the organization of things on one level will affect how the system or how the, the structures at the next level up function. And by reorganizing parts at, let's say, the chemical level, right, you can generate different kinds of structure at the cellular level. The next idea is that each time you jump a level in complexity, you see brand new properties that were not present in the level below it. And these are referred to as emergent properties. So I'm going to go through two examples. One is really low on the hierarchical level, it involves atoms um, combining to form molecules. And the second is um, looking at macromolecules, huge molecules that are organized to produce cells. So the first example, we're going to talk about the element sodium, which is a shiny silver, very soft metal. You can cut it with um, a plastic knife or fork. Um, it's also ridiculously explosive. Then we've got chlorine. Chlorine in its elemental form is a pale yellowy green gas. It's very corrosive um, and, and super poisonous. Um, it was actually used as a chemical weapon um, in the First World War um, because it liquefies your lungs. So be careful with chlorine. Um, so you've got an explosive silver metal and something that is a gas and is poisonous and toxic, corrosive to living tissue. So let's see what happens when you combine them. We've asked Lonnie to demonstrate the formation of an ionic bond. In this case, the bond between sodium and chlorine in sodium chloride. So Lonnie's filled a beaker with elemental chlorine. That's chlorine gas, Cl2. It's a yellow gas. He'll also use solid sodium metal. Solid sodium metal is a shiny silver metal that's very soft. He can actually cut it with a knife. Sodium metal is very reactive. It will react in air and water so it's stored under hexane. He'll pull off a small chunk and immediately store it under hexane while he prepares the rest of the experiment. Now, to get the reaction to go, he'll want to clean the sodium, make the surface very clean, and warm it slightly to help the reaction proceed. He'll do that by placing the sodium in a spatula and then warming it over a flame to clean the surface and to get the sodium warm enough to initiate the chemical reaction. So the reaction goes because the positive ions formed on sodium and the negative ions formed on chlorine are drawn together, a coulombic interaction, to form an ionic bond. The formation of that ionic bond, plus and minus charges attracted together, releases energy, and that's the driving force for this chemical reaction and you can see that it's exothermic. Energy is being released. Now the reaction between sodium and chlorine, of course, forms sodium chloride. And you end with a sodium and a chlorine.
Now, obviously, in a full salt shaker, you have, I didn't even know what the word would be to describe how many molecules of sodium chloride there are. Gajillions. That's my technical term. All right, so the second example of an emergent property. Um, these images, don't scream when you see them, um, eventually they will make sense to you or you'll be able to interpret them. Um, if you sort of let the chemical structures fade into the background and just look at the words, you see carbohydrates, proteins, right? You're familiar with those. That's what's in the food you eat. Um, you may not realize that also in the food you eat are molecules called nucleic acids. Um, anytime you eat a food, like let's say um, a baked potato or a strawberry or a cheeseburger, you're eating the tissues of um, a previously living thing, a plant or an animal. And any food that hasn't been super pro processed is going to contain that organism's DNA, which is stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, nucleic acid, right? You're familiar with lipids as well, although perhaps not by that term. That oil waxes. So we eat what we're made of. If I have carbohydrates, proteins, DNA, lipids in just the right combinations, get the mother of all emergent properties and one that we still don't quite understand 